name is Kathy Flynn, and I am the Senior uh, Director of Engagement for the uh, American Liver Foundation. Welcome to today's webinar, Fatty Liver Disease and Nutrition. The American Liver Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit serving people with liver disease. Since 1976, we have provided a voice for patients with liver disease and their families through education, support services, research, and advocacy. Throughout the current pandemic, our commitment to liver health education is stronger than ever. Today's featured speaker is Dr. David Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein is a gastroenterologist specialist who treats patients with liver disease at Northwell Health in Long Island. He is the chief of hepatology, the director of the Sandra Atlas Bass Center for Liver Disease at Northwell, and professor at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. He received his medical education at SUNY Stony Brook School of Medicine and completed his residency at Montefiore Medical Center's Moses Division, as well as a fellowship at the University of Miami School of Medicine. Dr. Bernstein is also an active member of the American Liver Foundation's Greater New York Medical Advisory Council. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein, for sharing your time and expertise with our audience today. The American Liver Foundation recognizes Octopharma USA for its generous support of this educational webinar. And at this time, my colleague Warren Hall, our national programs manager, will familiarize everyone with the mechanics on how the webinar will work. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to, to be here to be a part of this wonderful uh, webinar. Uh, I just want to say I'm looking very much forward to this because one of my main responsibilities at the Liver Foundation is that I oversee our national helpline. Uh, our national helpline receives nearly 10,000 inquiries every year. And uh, I could tell you that in the top, oh, four or five topics that come in, uh, fatty liver disease is right in there. And so that's why uh, discussions like this are so important. And as we know with fatty liver disease, nutrition is a key part of that. And so I'm, uh, I'm very excited myself about this uh, webinar tonight uh, and about uh, having the doctor with us. Um, so a few housekeeping uh, rules or uh, information that we have here. Um, everybody's microphones are muted, so uh, we so you can't yell out your uh, questions that you might have for the doctor. Uh, but we do want your questions, and so the way to do that is to use the, the chat feature. And so if you're not familiar with that, if you go to the uh, the bottom of your screen, if you hover your mouse over there, you're going to see a little bubble that's going to come up. It says the word chat. Um, you can uh, write your questions in there at any time uh, throughout the presentation. Maybe as something strikes uh, you uh, uh, as a question or something you've been wondering about, put that question right in there. And then what we'll do is at the end of the, uh, the webinar, uh, Dr. Bernstein will be with us uh, to answer some of the questions uh, that you have. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can. And for those that we don't, we'll try to get that information out to you at another time. And so uh, without further ado, uh, I want to turn this over to, to Dr. Bernstein and welcome him uh, on behalf of the American Liver Foundation. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, do the screen share thing. And can you guys see this okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Perfect. That's usually the most difficult part. So I'd just like to thank you all uh, for those lo that lovely uh, introduction. Thank everyone uh, for attending. And what I'd like to do in the next 40 minutes or so is really talk about uh, fatty liver, uh, Navold Nash, which uh, despite the pun is America's uh, biggest epidemic. So if you look at this slide, which has been in many different places, you can sort of see where we are today. And we'd be the people, unfortunately, all the way to the right. <laughs> and with that has truly come uh, a rise in the number of folks with fatty liver. To put it in perspective, when I first started uh, doing this in liver disease down at the University of Miami, at this point, almost 30 years ago, fatty liver really didn't exist unless people were on steroids and had a known medication to cause it. But now, uh, it's the most common chronic liver disease in the United States. And so how common, you know, then, you know, would this be? Uh, 
So we know, as I said, that this is the most common liver disease in the US. And I'll show you that it affects over 100 million people. Currently, it's the second most common reason why people get a liver transplant in the United States. And for people under the age of 50, it's the most common indication. Alcohol is the number one indication. The other thing that's happened is it has become recognized to be the leading predisposing factor for causing primary liver cancer, overtaking hepatitis C and hepatitis B. And it can even occur in the absence of cirrhosis, something we don't see with many chronic liver diseases. And most people with fatty liver are actually going to have normal liver enzymes in labs. Uh, remember that when you look at your laboratory tests, in particular the ALT and the AST, most of the labs have an upper limit of normal of 40. But what we do know is that there are different normals for men and women, and they're both much lower. So for a woman, anyone with an ALT more than 25, or a man, anyone with an ALT of greater than 35, that's abnormal. So if you happen to be a woman and your labs come back as having an ALT and AST of 35, well, that's actually significantly abnormal, even though it's read as normal. So the majority of people with fatty liver will have normal enzymes when they go to the lab. So if we look at the prevalence then, and I said about a third of the population has disease, so a little over 100 million people, uh, most of those people do fine and truly never have a problem related to this. But some will progress, and about a fifth will go on to develop significant inflammation and scarring in the liver. And that's what we term NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. And that's really an inflection point when people move from just fat to inflammation and scarring. And then over time, that inflammation can lead to more scarring, more fibrosis, and eventually the development of cirrhosis. Uh, and we think there are about four and a half million people undiagnosed in the United States walking around with cirrhosis secondary to NASH. It's a large number. It's larger than any other liver disease uh, that we know of as a cause of underlying cirrhosis. And this is what we see sort of happens, right? Uh, people are born with a normal liver. They develop fat. If there's no inflammation and no other findings, it's just fat. But if it progresses to inflammation and scarring, and we term ballooning, that's steatohepatitis. And that continued inflammation, as you can see here pictorially, leads to fibrosis, cirrhosis, and a greater risk of hepatocellular carcinoma. This process starts early. And unfortunately, what we're seeing is that it's happening more and more amongst children, teenagers. And so by the time they enter their 20s, 30s, and 40s, they already may have significant disease. Uh, and so our job is really to recognize this, uh, diagnose this, and then recommend treatment plans, which we'll talk about, which are currently uh, dietary related. And this looks at the prevalence. You know, what are the trends? And this was published about a year ago. And you can see that the bulk of the patients are considered young. 45 to 64, right? And it's slightly greater in men than in women. But if you look at the percentage of people who are aged 20 to 44, and even in their teens, the numbers are significant. So as that age group gets older, we're going to see more significant disease at an earlier date. So this is not a disease of older people. This is a disease of younger people. And this really does explain why this is the leading indication for liver transplantation in people under age 50. So we have a crisis of fatty liver, which parallels our crisis of obesity and our crisis of diabetes uh, in this country. So how do we screen, right? Or do we screen, right? Since most people look good, feel fine, and liver tests are normal. And here, unfortunately, we are getting different recommendations from different organizations. So I picked three, uh, that I think would be the three big ones. The ASLD is the American Association for the Study of Liver Disease. They actually recommend no screening for fatty liver disease. But if their patients have type two diabetes, we should maintain a high degree of suspicion for fatty liver disease and then look. 
Okay. Um, not the most specific, uh, and probably with that, you're going to miss a lot. The Europeans, the easel, easel folks, European Association of Study of Liver Disease, uh, they recommend that anyone who's obese or with the metabolic syndrome should be screened with liver enzymes with or without an abdominal sonogram. And that patients who are considered high risk, those who are more than age 50, those with type 2 diabetes, and those with cardiovascular disease, should be screened for more advanced disease. And interestingly enough, the most aggressive screening is recommended by the American Diabetes Association. So endocrinologists, not liver doctors. Mm -hmm. And they recommend that NASH and fibrosis screening should occur in patients with type two diabetes or with prediabetes if they have an elevated ALT and they use for normal an ALT in a woman of more than 25 and an ASC in a man of more than 35. So the ADA is probably the most aggressive in looking for patients to try to help. And it would make sense since I'll show you in a few moments how common this condition is in people with diabetes. So what are the risk factors then, you know, for fatty liver? Uh, the top two are being diabetic or pre-diabetic and being obese. Uh, and with diabetes comes insulin resistance. So this is something seen in type two diabetes, not type one diabetes. There are some risk based on ethnicity and I'll go over that. Uh, there are some genetic predisposing risks, uh, which I am not going to go over here. Uh, we know that in patients that have dyslipidemia, that have hypertension or have polycystic ovarian syndrome, they're also at risk for developing fatty liver. But if you had to pick the most important risks, uh, they would be diabetes, prediabetes, or obesity. Uh, and just mild obesity is sufficient. This looks at how common fatty liver disease is in patients with type two diabetes. And you can see across the world that about 50% on average of people with type two diabetes also have fatty liver disease. And so these are the folks that are at high risk to go on to develop other complications of liver disease and this really does need to be addressed. And you can see here that having diabetes uh, versus not having diabetes in people that have fatty liver, those with diabetes are far more likely to go on to develop cirrhosis in a not too long period of time, about a decade, uh, than those who don't have diabetes. And so again, it becomes critically important uh, that if someone has been diagnosed with diabetes, that they get their sugars under control. Because as we'll talk about, the treatments for fatty liver really are diet, exercise, weight loss, and if you have diabetes, control of that diabetes. Uh, and diabetes, as I'm sure you're aware, has lots of other complications as well, in particular cardiovascular disease or microvascular disease, which puts these patients at a higher risk of heart issues uh, as well, and actually can make a transplant more difficult if the diabetes uh, has not been well controlled over time. What about then the prevalence of people with obesity, uh, of fatty liver, and then NASH? Well, the prevalence of fatty liver in people that are obese uh, is over 70% of the population of the United States. And those that have NASH, so and those that have crossed over that inflection point, they're having the risk of more advanced disease and developing cirrhosis and all its complications, it's about 30%. Now, mean in perspective, well, it's estimated that by 2030, so 10 years from now, almost half of the adults in the United States will be medically obese. So we are really talking about significant numbers of people that are going to have this problem. So this truly is uh, the epidemic for the next one to two decades uh, of liver disease. Oops, let me go back. I'm sorry. So what factors lead then to obesity and fatty liver? Well, I, they're, they're sort of common sense. Uh, if you don't spend a lot of time exercising and you sit at your desk all day long and have sedentary behavior, you're more likely to gain weight and develop 
uh, fatty liver disease. If you ingest increased saturated fats and saturated fats are bad, uh, then you're more likely again to develop this problem. Having high calories, eating a lot, again, greater risk. And if probably the greatest risk is if you take in anything with fructose, fructose corn syrup, just fructose. And if you look carefully at labels, almost all the snacks that you get in the snack aisle or all the sodas uh, have corn syrup or fructose corn syrup, they're the same thing. Uh, and that is probably the number one danger uh, that one intakes uh, leading to more advanced uh, liver disease. Uh, we know that there's a significant correlation between BMI, body mass index, and waist circumference. The larger your waist is, uh, the more likely you are to develop advanced disease. Now that's a positive as well, because if you lose weight, uh, the liver can actually improve. And so we look carefully, not only at people's BMIs, but we ask them about their pant size and to see if it's growing or shrinking. And that becomes very important in part of the simple you know, evaluation. This is current self-reporting for obesity in 2018 in the United States. I don't know where people on this you know, webinar are from, uh, but you can see states that are in dark red uh, have more than 35% of their population reporting themselves as obese. And only three areas of the country, two states and the District of Columbia, self-report uh, having a obesity rate of between 20 and 25%. Uh, now, I said earlier that the country is getting larger. Uh, and so this is estimated that half the adults by 2030 will have uh, obesity. And so we expect these colors to change uh, and newer colors uh, to be added to really represent uh, higher degrees of prevalence of obesity in this country. And that will translate into more fatty liver and uh, more advanced liver disease. But we're not alone. Uh, the country that is actually has the greatest increased prevalence of fatty liver is China. And this is a similar map to our US map of the provinces of China. Uh, and you can see how it is the number of fatty liver is increasing and it seems to be directly related to wealth and the adoption of a Western diet, uh, which seems to be uh, the root of all evil in many respects. So we know now through many studies that our Western lifestyle and diet has been associated with weight gain, obesity, uh, and fatty liver. So we have to think about uh, what we eat. What is the prevalence then by ethnicity in the US? Well, almost 60% of the Hispanic population in the United States has fatty liver, 45% of the Caucasian population, and 35% of the African American population. We don't have good data on the Asian American population just yet, but that is being collected. But if you look at the almost 60% of the Hispanic population in the United States has fatty liver, that group also has a much higher prevalence of diabetes. So it really is a group that needs to be targeted uh, for disease identification and putting in a treatment plan uh, to help prevent disease you know, in the future. Uh, I like this, this is, uh, was given to me by uh, the gentleman who trained me. Uh, it's a description of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Uh, the top right is a normal liver and the bottom right is a fatty liver. You can see how yellow it is. And the equivalent of fatty liver would be foie gras, right? You have to force feed ducks to get fatty liver, but people seem to be able to develop it all on their own. And that's exactly what it will look like. Uh, and so just to keep that in mind for those who uh, wanna think about that. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have in this country which leads to fatty liver is food insecurity. And through the COVID epidemic, we've learned a lot more about food uh, insecurity. It's defined as the state of being without reliable access to sufficient quantity of affordable, nutritious food and instead relying on low cost, energy dense, nutritionally poor foods. And that's linked to obesity, the metabolic syndrome and diabetes. It leads to increases 
in the degree of hepatic fibrosis and cirrhosis. And it's associated with certain characteristics or descriptors. Uh, African-American or Hispanic populations, those without health insurance, those at an education below the secondary school level, people who are younger, women, and those who have an elevated BMI of more than 35. So this really is a societal problem. And again, with the COVID pandemic, we're hearing a lot more about food insecurity and people's needs and inability to get food. But also what has changed is actually what we eat. So this slide is about 10 years old. In fact, the next couple of slides are about 10 years old. So 30 years ago, a bagel, the most common bread food in the United States, was about three inches in diameter and it was 140 calories. Now an average bagel is six inches in diameter and 350 calories. That's before you add the cream cheese and everything else to it to, to make it really a hearty breakfast. 30 years ago, an average cheeseburger from any of the local shops had about 330 calories. Now it's uh, almost 600 calories. And so we're doubling. If you add a soda and french fries to that, well, you're well into the 13, 1400 calories, remembering that we'd like people to eat somewhere between 1600 and 2000 calories a day. So it doesn't take much with this kind of food to go over that uh, limit. And, you know, it's common for people to have a couple of cheeseburgers these days when they go out. And then probably the biggest culprit is soda. Uh, forget the fact that it has fructose, it has lots of calories. Uh, 30 years ago, the average size of a bottle of soda was eight, was six and a half ounces and 85 calories. Now, the average is uh, 20 ounces uh, with over 250 calories. And people drink this uh, really to excess. Uh, some people have tried to regulate it, but unfortunately, uh, couldn't be done. And so you, you see a problem related. And these are, there are many other examples as well. So how do, how do people with fatty liver then present? Well, for the most part, they're asymptomatic. Uh, the majority are discovered by chance. Someone has to do, someone does an ultrasound or some of the blood tests are abnormal uh, or on exam, someone feels a large liver and that leads to some sort of investigation. Uh, but at the end of the day, millions and millions of people uh, with advanced liver disease just suffer in silence, don't know, uh, keep harming their liver uh, up until the point that they have a catastrophe and then they end up coming in and wonder, why wasn't it picked up after all these years if I had this? Because it does take a long time uh, to develop advanced liver disease. So how do we then assess severity when someone has been diagnosed? There are lots and lots of different ways that we can do that. We use a combination of serum biomarkers, which are essentially blood tests, and most of them uh, require just a simple calculation on a smartphone. They don't have to be send out tests. And we also can do imaging. Transient elastography, uh, many of you may have heard it as FibroScan, uh, or shear wave elastography can be used. They're simple in-office tests that tell us how much fat and how much scarring may be present. More and more, we're using MRE, MR elastography, which is probably better, but it does have more cost and not as readily available. But we have lots of non-invasive ways now to make a diagnosis of fatty liver. What we can't do is make a diagnosis of NASH because that requires a biopsy to look for inflammation. So none of these tests tell us anything about inflammation. They tell us about fat, and they tell us about scarring. And here you can see the two most common scores that we use, the FIB4 or the NAPO fibrosis score. Uh, you can see the parameters that are there. It doesn't cost anything extra to do this. You just get your labs, you put it into your smartphone, it automatically calculates. And these are very good at predicting minimal amounts of scarring or high amounts of scarring. In the middle, not so good. But in the middle, we really don't care so much. Uh, we really want to know if there's a lot of scarring or a little scarring because that affects you know, how we follow somebody. And just as an example, uh, just so people can see, uh, this is the NAPO fibrosis score. And if we put in a sample patient who's 45 years old, has a BMI of 30, so you know, normal BMI would be 20 to 25, overweight would be 26 to 30, and, be, and obese would be 30 to 35, morbidly obese above that, right? Uh, if the patient has 
pre-diabetes or diabetes, we check that off. We have their numbers there, the AST and the ALT are 45 and 40. So in whatever lab that this was done, they were read as normal. Platelet count is normal, albumin is low end of normal. If you put it into the actual computer uh, and get this score, this patient probably has cirrhosis. Yet they'd have absolutely no idea and none of the blood tests at all would lead the doctors to say, oh, I'm concerned that this patient has underlying cirrhosis. So this is why we do this type of testing in patients that have you know, fatty liver. So NASH, NAFL or fatty liver can be diagnosed on imaging, but NASH can't. So we can get a sonogram and here you can see the liver uh, or we can get a CAT scan and you can see the liver on the left and we compare it to the spleen on the right. And if there's increased what's called epigenicity, uh, then we know that there's fat that's present. This is transient elastography. This is the fiber scan or the shear wave. And we can use that simple probe that you can see in the middle. It takes about five to 10 minutes to do and we get a pretty good representation of one area of the liver as to how much fat and how much scarring is present. Uh, this is the pictures that we get at MRI uh, and MRE, which tells us how much scarring there is and how much fat. And you can see how much more accurate this is uh, than a fiber scan, because this looks at the entire liver, where the fiber scan looks at just a small piece. And this, I just want people to see, just to get a, an understanding. Uh, all the way to the left is a patient that has significant fat within the liver prior to bariatric surgery. And so 30% of the liver is fat. If you look at six months postoperatively, uh, you can see that the fat has pretty much gone away. It's down to about 4%. And we see this, and this is with weight loss. And so this is what encourages us to encourage patients to diet, exercise, and lose weight because fatty liver is reversible and it's reversible with loss of weight. So how do we diagnose NASH? I mentioned that earlier. Uh, we do a biopsy. It's the only test which actually diagnoses NASH. And what you see is these typical findings that you can see here. Uh, but do we have to do a biopsy on everyone with fatty liver disease? The answer is no. Uh, we really can't biopsy a third of the population. We just don't have uh, the available resources. And we also don't have treatments. And so we make a presumptive diagnosis uh, of this, and then we make recommendations. And that, that's why I'd like to move on to then treatment, right? Uh, and for those who are World War II buffs like me, it's the battle of the bulge, right? And that really is the problem here. The goals of treatment are simple, but hard to obtain, right? You want to improve any metabolic abnormalities if they exist, decrease inflammation, prevent, arrest, and reverse uh, fibrosis, prevent the advancement of liver disease, prevent the development of liver failure, liver cancer, and hopefully have better systemic outcomes, meaning diabetes improvement, heart better, kidney improves as well. So the basic tenant then of treatment is lifestyle modification. First and foremost is the reduction of caloric intake. You gotta stop putting in your mouth if this is going to work. And we usually recommend that people decrease their caloric intake by about 30% of their baseline or 750 to 1000 kilocalories a day. And that's been shown to improve insulin resistance and hepatic steatosis and really eliminate consumption of any fructose enriched beverages. Uh, Anything with fructose defeats the purpose of dieting. So you really do have to avoid that. Weight loss is recommended. Uh, uh, you want to lose minimum of three to 5%, but you truly do need to lose six to 10 or greater than 10% to statistically and dramatically improve underlying NASH and fibrosis and even reverse cirrhosis. Exercise helpful, but doesn't work alone. It may reduce steatosis, but doesn't do anything to fibrosis or inflammation. But in combination with diet, it leads to weight loss, and then we see the positive effects. So we can recommend diet alone in people that can't exercise, but we don't uh, recommend exercise alone. You do need diet and exercise 
to produce that weight loss and you truly want to decrease or eliminate heavy alcohol consumption. You don't have to stop completely. Having a drink every now and then is fine, uh, but you don't want to have heavy alcohol consumption recently defined as one drink per day uh, is considered heavy alcohol consumption. Uh, and what we've learned to be protective to the liver, especially in people who drink is cups of coffee. So the current recommendations are that if your heart can handle it, you should be drinking at least two cups of caffeinated coffee a day for its hepatoprotective effects. And this is something that you know people can do uh, if it's healthy. So to sort of summarize, we have that energy uh, restriction, decrease the calories that one takes in, uh, have that coffee. Um, if you're going to look at a diet, it should consist of something that's low to moderate fat, uh, moderate to high uh, carbohydrates, and ensure you also have some, uh, think about these low carbohydrate uh, ketogenic diets. Avoid all fructose, uh, really decrease or limit the amount of alcohol one takes uh, and have physical activity. At least 200 minutes a week of moderate intensity, usually in five to six sessions. Uh, and resistance training is also you know, quite helpful. So this is the core of treatment currently, right? But for physicians in the US, uh, the system really isn't set up because we're given 15 minutes to talk to people to go through all of this. So it has to happen in stages. Um, we send a lot of patients to nutritionists or dietitians who are life coaches who can really help people. And they truly do get uh, some good results. Uh, of all the slides I'm going to show you, this is the most important. This basically looks at a study of patients with fatty liver disease who dieted and exercised and lost weight. So if you look at the first line, NASH resolution, um, if people lost 10% of their body weight, NASH resolved in 90% of people, and this is biopsy proven. Fibrosis regression occurred in 80%. Fat improvement in 100% but only 10% who are actually able to lose 10% of their body weight, which means if you're 200 pounds and you're overweight, you have to lose 20 pounds to see that effect. If you're 250 pounds uh, and overweight, you have to lose 25 pounds at least to get that effect. So those are actually very doable and they don't have to happen overnight. If people can lose one to two pounds a month, it may take two years, but they'll get there. And you're much better off changing a diet uh, that you can tolerate as opposed to many of these fad diets, which we'll discuss, where you lose weight, but then as soon as you stop, uh, you gain your weight back. So given that we don't have a lot of evidence on specific diets, what advice can we actually give to people you know, about what to eat? And it usually starts with, should dietary sugar be limited in patients with fatty liver disease? Because we've all been taught that sugar is bad, right? Well, maybe we were taught uh, correctly. What you can see here on the left is that there's a higher prevalence of fatty liver uh, with people who eat you know, added sugars. So you really do want to limit uh, the amount of sugar. And on the right, you can see the difference in fatty liver prevalence in those people that have sugar-sweetened beverages or those with fructose. Uh, and it's also small numbers, uh, but much greater incidence of fatty liver in people that had sugar sweetened or fructose uh, sweetened vegetables, so uh, beverages. So we really wanna limit uh, the amount of sugars. We talk about starch versus sugar versus high fructose corn syrup. Is fructose the problem? Well, if you look here, the, the, the answer is actually yes. Uh, we know that you know, the more glucose you have, it, it increases liver glycogen. Uh, and that gets stored in the liver, and that can lead to fat, but also the fructose, right? Uh, the fructose mainly contributes to lipogenesis. It generates significantly more fat. It generates uric acid. It generates other potential um, items uh, that can lead to inflammation, which leads to more NASH, more scarring, and eventually cirrhosis. So fructose becomes the problem here. So if you can take, again, a second thing to take from this is 
when you go into the supermarket, just look at the label uh, and see whether or not anything has fructose and really try you know, to avoid that. So the ASLD, again, doesn't give us a heck of a lot of guidance. Uh, they don't recommend any specific recommendation for restricting sugar. My opinion, just my opinion, uh, I think there's an excellent theoretical reasons to limit sugar in patients with fatty liver. I think in everyone actually, and certainly limiting the exposure to fructose and insulin will prove beneficial. And that's actually been shown uh, to be there. Uh, what about diet strategies? There are lots of different diets, high protein, high carb, uh, paleo diet, gluten-free, you know, what's important is get on a diet that they can actually adhere to. Uh, that they lose weight, and that they're eating foods uh, which are healthy. And the body will generally adjust to the rest. Uh, but it also has to be something that you can do for a long time. Just going on a diet for a month or two months isn't going to solve the problem because losing weight and gaining weight is probably more dangerous than remaining at that higher weight level. Right? Big fluctuations are not healthy for us. And so what do we generally recommend? The Probably the best diet out there, and I'll show you studies which actually support that, is the Mediterranean diet. And this is just an example. Uh, I pulled this off of the internet. You know, it's a diet heavy in physical activity, but fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, nuts, most of the protein is as far as fish and seafood. It doesn't limit eggs, cheese, meats, or even wine. Uh, it recommends a lot of water. Uh, and, you know, we don't see fatty liver as much in the Mediterranean countries where uh, this diet is, is followed pretty closely. And so uh, the Mediterranean diet, this was an observational study of si uh, people who for six months followed uh, closely on a Mediterranean diet. And what you can see in this uh, bar graph is based on the uh, amount of fat in the liver, uh, things decreased significantly uh, with the Mediterranean diet. Dramatic decrease in the amount of fat just by following. And of course, yes, this was associated uh, with some weight loss. This study actually compared the Mediterranean diet to a, just a low fat diet. And it followed people for 18 months. And, and what you can see here is both following a Mediterranean diet and a low fat diet significantly decreased the amount of hepatic fat content in the Mediterranean diet from 27% to 5%, much greater uh, than the low fat diet, which went down to 16%, but also improved, right? So you can't take that away from it. But it also the Mediterranean diet was associated with a significantly greater improvement of cardiovascular disease risk than just following a low fat diet. So we recommend our patients to go on the internet, pull up an example of a Mediterranean diet, find what they like and follow them. What about other diets? Uh, there are some that have evidence in fatty liver and some that don't. So there are the DASH diets, which are dietary approaches to stop hypertension, right? Those are very similar to a Mediterranean diet and have been shown to correlate with lower prevalence you know, of fatty liver disease. What about all of these other commercial diets that people are taking? I use, for example, Weight Watchers, Jenny Craig. They may be efficacious for weight loss, uh, but we don't have data in fatty liver. And so I'm going to speak from the data, and we just don't have it. Enthusiasm for fasting regimens is there, but again, we don't have data in fatty liver disease. Probably anything that leads to weight loss will lead to an improvement. Uh, the question is, can you take these diets for long periods of time? You know, so you really, the best diets are those that you change your diet completely over time uh, and have real behavioral modification. Just a one month thing or a two week thing is really not going to do it you know, for these patients. And no matter what we do, these patients, these diets have to be heart healthy. So we have to ensure that what people are taking don't worsen uh, the risk of cardiovascular disease, heart disease. And so really have to be careful, you know, about that. And that's a discussion you should have with your physicians uh, and or nutritionists. So the popular diets, uh, Mediterranean is a good diet. Uh, it's a balanced diet. There's a lot of evidence, you know, that it works in both the short and the long term. 
Some of these other diets, the fad diets, the more restrictive diets, they may work in the short term, but long-term data is actually lacking. And so you have to have a discussion with your patients about what you think is best for them and what they can actually do. Uh, because if they don't want to do it, it's not going to happen. They have to buy into this and realize that this is the treatment right now because everyone wants a pill that really doesn't exist. Uh, people are always concerned about vitamins you know, and the liver. Uh, in general, people with fatty liver have lower levels of zinc, copper, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E. Uh, no one's exactly sure why that is, but I do recommend that my patients take a multivitamin without iron. Uh, you know, the generic one would be fine, whatever is available, but I think that's important if they're not going to have a good diet. Um, no vitamins are approved or recommended to treat fatty liver, um, except for vitamin E. Uh, vitamin E has been shown in one study uh, now about 10 years ago that at doses of 800 international units a day will improve uh, histology in non-diabetic adults with NASH, uh, but it has risks potentially associated with it. Uh, in men, it has been linked to the development of prostate cancer. And you, in order to recommend use of vitamin E, the patient actually needs to have a liver biopsy uh, and show that they have NASH. And so you shouldn't be using vitamin E unless the patient has had a liver biopsy. And you shouldn't be using it in diabetics. And you, know, you have to have a discussion with men about that increased risk of prostate cancer. Uh, this is bariatric surgery. I showed you an MRI a little bit earlier. Uh, but any one of these that leads to weight loss will lead to um, improvement in a patient's overall uh, condition within the liver. And more and more patients are getting sleeve gastrectomy. In patients without portal hypertension who have cirrhosis, they can safely undergo this sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, they will lose weight and their liver histology will likely improve. And so you really do treat two problems uh, with this type of intervention. So having said all of that, where are we going in the future? And let me take the last couple of minutes um, before we open up the questions to talk about some of the potential emerging therapies or the theories. Um, I preface this by saying there are currently no medical therapies for fatty liver or NASH. There are none at this point that are even close. And when I say even close, to be available to the public for the next couple of years, most things have failed. Uh, and so there's been a change in a bit of the thinking. There are lots of different potential mechanisms to treat fatty liver. None of these will work in the absence of diet, exercise, and weight loss. And so that's important. These are all going to be adjuncts, but there has to be a commitment to a change in lifestyle uh, for patients to actually improve. Um, and then when people start these medicines, some of the questions that remain unanswered are, how long does one have to take it? What are the endpoints? You know, how do we know when to stop? Uh, and so we're still truly in a learning phase. Yet, when you go to the liver meetings or other meetings, there are numerous studies that are being presented, most of which are positive, uh, some of which are not. Uh, but what they don't give you is what happened to the weight uh, when patients are taking these medications. So for example, a class of drugs called GLP-1, which is used for diabetes and approved for obesity, causes weight loss. Uh, so if you take that, studies are showing you have significant improvement in your liver disease. That's excellent because it's a weight loss drug in essence. And so we're sort of learning. Uh, but what we do really believe is that, and this is just an example, uh, made up example, if you will. Uh, but the future is going to be multiple medications associated with diet, exercise, and weight loss. No one medicine via one mechanism will likely be sufficient to treat fatty liver. So we're going to have to have combinations. And whether they are individual pills taken together or pills that are formulated with multiple medications in one remains to be seen. Uh, but there's no doubt that the future is going to be these combination therapies uh, that are used. So to summarize, uh, fatty liver is the most common liver disease in the U.S. and worldwide. About 20% of people will develop NASH, and those are the ones who are at risk of developing complications, including cirrhosis and liver cancer. 
Liver biopsy remains an important tool that we use, but non-invasive tools are available and we're using them more and more. At the end of the day, despite all the treatments uh, that we're considering, whatever it takes to lose weight is going to be the cornerstone of, excuse me, of therapy. Bariatric surgery seems to be the most effective right now, uh, but you have to meet strict criteria in order to get uh, bariatric surgery. And multiple therapies you know, are currently being developed. And in the next few years, we hope to have something, but there's nothing on the immediate horizon. So I'm gonna end with this from The Economist in 2003. Please take action, healthy food choices, regular phys physical activity, Let's stop our evolution into the gentleman uh, all the way to the right. And so I thank you guys very much for your attention. And I guess we move to the question and answer session. Is that right? That's right, That's right Doctor. Doctor. Thank you so much for this, uh, uh, boy, very much uh, in depth. And, uh, and I think a lot of good information uh, you know, for people to hear. We do have a few questions. Uh, some did come in prior to the, um, uh, to the presentation. Uh, so you might have answered some of them, but maybe some could be elaborated on. Um, so, so one question um, that uh, did come in was, um, my doctor said, uh, just simply said, just lose a few pounds and get some exercise. Uh, what you're saying here seems to be a lot more uh, than just that. Yeah, I mean, th there really has to be a plan. You know, uh, I think when we as the medical profession say, you know, Lose, exercise and lose weight, we don't give anyone any parameter. And it makes it very difficult. How do you know? So I, I do think people have to meet with their healthcare provider and establish goals, you know? Yep. And, you know, so, so for example, you know, I like to say if people can lose one to two pounds a month, that's great. And it may take a year or two to get where you want to go, right? If you lose more, that's great. But you then have to be regularly brought in, weighed, encouraged, you know, discuss diet. I think a nutritionist or a dietitian are really key to these discussions. Most healthcare providers don't have that. We don't in our office. So we have some discussions, but we refer out, but they truly do make a big difference. Mm. Uh, you know, that kind of leads uh, right into another question we have. Uh, this question is, can't quick weight loss worsen liver disease or other uh, physical uh, issues? So it's interesting, yes. Extremely rapid uh, weight loss has been associated with development of acute hepatitis. And so it can cause problems. Now, most of the time it doesn't, right? And so, you know, weight loss is a good thing. You know, the problem with really, really rapid weight loss on some of these fad diets, if you let me call them that, is that, you know, people lose weight quickly and then they go off the diet and they very because they haven't changed their lifestyle behavior they go back and they they go back up again and then the problem is, is there again and it's probably worse to lose all that weight and gain it back is far less healthy for the body than staying you know even or slowly going going down uh, this isn't the, the tortoise and the hare kind of thing you know this is really the tortoise you got to go slow you got to change your behavior uh and it's, you got to be able to really be consistent and be able to change your diet so that the last year is not weeks. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so another question, uh, for years, my liver enzymes have been normal, but then after an abdominal ultrasound for something else, I was told I had fatty liver. Should that have been detected sooner? And why were my enzyme levels normal? Uh, and so the, the first question is, you know, is, is what everyone asks, should it be detected sooner? You know, if the current recommendations are not to screen. So if there are no symptoms, the answer would be no. Mm. You know, I touched on a little bit earlier that, you know, significant numbers of people have normal liver enzymes. Uh, and they do. Uh, and it just comes as a surprise when they find out they have fatty liver or, or even cirrhosis. Remembering that the most common liver enzyme pattern in someone with cirrhosis is normal. It's not abnormal. You know, what I would do is I would go back to your labs uh, and see, you know, you, if you have the records, you know, there's a difference between normal. What, do, what does the lab call normal? And so 
if I can get people to not look at the right side of the column, which is high or low, but actually look at the number of the liver enzymes. You know, Cause some of the labs, the ALT upper liver normal is 40, 45, 60, 70. You know, in a woman, any ALT more than 25 is abnormal and in a man more than 35. Mm -hmm. So what may have been called normal uh, may actually have been abnormal. So you just have to go back and quite frankly, it's a relatively new phenomenon for physicians outside of liver disease to then recognize, you know, this. Okay, um, so you, you did talk about the Mediterranean style of eating, which you uh, highly recommend, it seems. Uh, but someone had asked, um, what about a whole food, what about a whole food plant-based diet? Uh, is that good to follow? And you talked about sugar. Uh, what about some information about salt? So I'm gonna answer the salt one first because I remembered it and then you'll remind me what the first one was. <laughs> So yeah, we did talk about sugar. I mean, so salt, salt doesn't worsen liver disease, right? But what salt does do is raise one's blood pressure, right? Which puts someone at greater risk of stroke, heart disease, and kidney disease. So salt really isn't an issue within the liver, uh, but it is, as I said, you know, those other organs. Uh, what about plant-based diets? Uh, right. Plant-based diets, um, if they're balanced, and if you're getting the appropriate protein that you need, and if you're getting the appropriate vitamins that you need, uh, that you get from certain meals that you may not be eating by eating the plant-based diets, that should be fine. Um, but you have, because if you lose weight, you know, that should help. But in people that are taking these pure plant-based diets, again, taking a multivitamin uh, is a good idea. Uh, because you may not be getting all of the vitamins, you know, that you do need. But if you lose weight on these plant-based diets, yes, your liver, uh, your fatty liver should improve. Uh, but can, how long can you stay on those plant-based diets is the question I would turn it back to people because I don't know that answer. Okay. Um, what about, you mentioned vitamins. Uh, what about natural supplements, things such as milk, thistle, and others and what about the products we see uh, that claim liver cleanses uh, or promoting liver health? Yeah, so man, those are great questions. So first and foremost, I'm gonna go out on a limb here and tell you that there's no such thing as a liver cleanse. That's absolute and utter BS. You know, this isn't something that you can clean. So that's utter nonsense. So I'm gonna stop there when I talk about liver cleanses. Milk thistle uh, has been shown to be safe. It has a 2000 year history, you know, of being used. And it has been shown in studies uh, in people with alcoholic liver disease to make them feel better. It doesn't do anything uh, to the underlying fibrosis. There's absolutely no data for use of milk thistle in any other uh, liver disease. You know, having said that, I would say half of my patients take milk thistle. It doesn't do any harm, right? So as long as you take something that's at least 80% milk thistle, silly mar, it, it really doesn't do harm. Uh, may hurt your wallet, but it doesn't really harm your body. Uh, and so if people want to take it, I usually don't object. You have to remember that a lot of these medications, including over-the-counter things like silly mar, interact with other medications and may make other medications less effective. So you really have to discuss everything that you're taking, whether it be prescribed over the counter herbal uh, with your healthcare provider so that he or she knows uh, if there, and can look up if there are any potential drug drug interactions. Okay. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just take one more here. Um, I've been diagnosed with NASH. Can that be reversed? What about fibrosis? Well, that's a good question to end on. So I think one of the takeaways here is that all of the findings uh, in NASH fibrosis and even compensated cirrhosis are reversible with currently diet, exercise, and weight loss. So if you were just diagnosed with NASH and some fibrosis, Absolutely, 
You could expect if you follow a diet and lose weight to have a significant improvement over time uh, in your underlying liver condition. And that's probably the, the most important fact people take away after a first visit to our office uh, because you have to encourage people and that's the truth. Uh, so fatty liver is reversible. And you could see in that MRI that I showed you that just in a short period of six months after bariatric surgery, pretty much all the fat went away. And we, we see this in studies now, even with oral agents, you know, in a few months, the fat literally just melts away. So yes, your disease is reversible if you diet, exercise, and weight loss. Great. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for taking those questions. Uh, for the folks that um, were not able to, we weren't able to get to your question, uh, or for those who are going to be watching the recording of this where you can't enter your questions, uh, I'm going to give a plug for my own uh, national helpline. Uh, you know, you can call us 1-800-GO-LIVER. Uh, we do live chat. Uh, if you're technology savvy, uh, uh, you can even write to us, uh, a lost art. Uh, but some people do uh, write to us at our New York office. Uh, and uh, please, uh, any questions you have, uh, always come to us at the American Liver Foundation. It's why we're here uh, and it's what we do. And so I'm very uh, honored to have had the chance to, uh, to be part of this with the doctor. And I'm gonna turn it now over back to uh, Kathleen. Thank you so much, Warren, and thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Um, as Warren said, the American Liver Foundation offers a variety of liver health resources to patients, providers, caregivers, and the general public. So please do visit our website to learn more about fatty liver disease and nutrition and other liver health topics. And of course, as Warren said, um, you can certainly call the national helpline. I'm sure he or someone on his team would be happy to assist you. Um, if you look up on the screen, we also invite you to um, like us on Facebook and YouTube. Follow us, please. Um, as a reminder, all of the attendees will be receiving an email uh, as a follow-up to this uh, program. And um, it will include a fatty liver disease toolkit. Um, these are valuable resources in the greater New York City area. Um, and we'll also be sending a, the YouTube link to this webinar for future viewing. Um, so if you or someone else that you know um, has an interest in learning more about fatty liver disease and going back to some of the wonderful um, data and uh, points that Dr. Bernstein made, please uh, revisit the webinar in the future. Um, again, a special thanks to Dr. Bernstein for sharing his expertise and his time with us today. And once again, the American Liver Foundation extends its gratitude to Octopharma for its philanthropic support of this educational program. On behalf of the American Liver Foundation, I thank everyone who's joined us today. We hope that you found it helpful and informative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Everyone. Have a good night.